You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. Well, David Clausen, Director of Biblical Worldview at Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. Uh, David is our guest for today as we talk about the integration of faith and politics. Now, in the in the country of Hungary, there is much uh, a very uh, unapologetic basis of the Christian faith and their law and their policy. Um, this is not something that is shied away from. It's not really disputed. It's just it's very much out there. And America, uh, depending on who you talk to, they're going to say different things. Some will say they were uh, you know America was founded as a Christian nation, a bona fide Christian nation. Others will say that it was founded on Christian principles. Uh, so, you know, the principles of Scripture should be reflected in our laws. And then others will say that there should be absolutely no no uh, collusion, if you will, whatsoever. And, of course, they will cite the separation of church and state, which the uh, really the only, the only thing we see alluding to that is more in the Federalist Papers, not so much in the Constitution, although some will argue that under the First Amendment— uh, the Establishment Clause, you know, Congress will, sit, will make no law establishing or recognizing a religion. You know, sometimes people will go to that as well. So these are all fun things to talk about. And uh, David, David Clausen, it is literally his job to be uh, the spokesperson for a very uh, prominent tank in Washington, D.C., a spokesperson about the integration of religion and politics. So, David, great to have you on the on the show, and we look forward to hearing uh, all the insight that you're going to bring. Well, John, thank you again for having me on the program. It's always a joy to have conversations with you. <laughs> yeah, David and I have done many of these over uh, over the years, so it's uh, it's fun to do it from uh, from across the sea. So, David, um, you know, as I mentioned, different countries are going to see it differently, and in the case of America, a lot of people within America see it differently as well. Um, so my, my first question for you is what is the basis, what is the reasoning to have the importance of having, uh, religion as part of law as sort of the foundation of law? And what are your thoughts on, um, America's history, the historicity of religion in American law? Yeah, John, so let me, at the onset of the conversation, kind of put all my cards on the table. You know, I'm a convictional Baptist. Uh, and so on theological principle alone, uh, I'm against establishment Um, now I want, um, and this would be the position of, you know, some of our friends like Andrew Walker, professor at Southern Seminary. Um, you know, he, he would say something similar that he's against for theological reasons and the establishment But we would both say we want civil society. We want culture. Uh, to be infused uh, with the leaven of the gospel. We want Christian convictions uh, to drive the, the public engagement that we are, are, are a part of. Um, and so that would put, you know, and, and that's in some ways that's unique to the Baptist tradition. You know, even the reformers, if you're thinking of Calvin, if you're thinking uh, in the work he did in Geneva, you're thinking of Luther. And kind of the Lutheran tradition, there's a much more willingness to have kind of an interdependence between the state and the church. Um, kind of Baptist, uh, again, for theological reasons, have always said, well, no, we don't want to co-mingle the state and the church. Uh, and so I think it's important for Lutheran to know kind of, I'm coming at this from a uniquely Baptist perspective. Um, you mentioned a second ago the phrase separation of church and state. And in the American history, uh, you know, that was a, like, you're, you're absolutely correct, John, pointing out that that phrase was not, uh, part of the U.S. Constitution. It was going to letter in 1802, uh, that, you know, well, I love this as a Baptist, uh, that Thomas Jefferson wrote that in a letter to the Danbury Baptist, uh, where he basically, you know, the, this group of Baptists were saying, you know, we're grateful that you're president. We really hope that you'll respect religion, that you'll respect the church. 
And he said, well, of course I will. I believe in the separation of truth and state. And what Jefferson meant by that was he recognizes that the state is the one that controls the store. And it's the state uh, that can be inclined towards overreaching. And so institutionally, for the sake of the protection of the church, uh, there should be institutional separation. But that does not mean uh, that religion and religious ideas have influence in government. Uh, but for the sake of the protection of the church, there should be institutional separation. Um, and again, I'm sure there's follow up to this. But I just think those kind of the outline principles are helpful to get the conversation going. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate that. So, I mean, it's funny you mentioned Calvin. So Calvin has actually had quite a uh, quite an influence in Eastern Europe. Uh, in fact, the church right by my apartment um, is it's the area there is called Calvin Square, uh, and and the church is is named after him as well. And several churches that I visited, not just here in Hungary, but in uh, Romania and and other countries, there is a lot of um, a lot of tribute to Calvin and some of the other reformers. It's pretty interesting. So we talk about the uh, the difference between religious influence in law and um, and having a theocracy. I, I think you used establishmentarianism, but like, yeah, but the theocracy essentially. Yeah, I don't really know any Christians who ardently want a theocracy, or at least I don't think they'll say they do. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, there is quite the difference. I mean, any any Christian who is somewhat theologically savvy will know that you literally can't force uh christianity uh and even if people will say well yeah we know that we can't force people to be saved but we can force them to live according to the christian law even that is not it's it's just not i don't see biblical support for that uh yes and this, there are there are uh biblical principles of justice and order that we see in scripture that i think absolutely uh has a role in law but my question here is a question: Where do we draw the line between what we do implement and what we don't implement from the Bible into uh, our laws? Yeah, I think as Christians, we need to be really honest and say that we we do believe that God's revealed truth in Scripture told us what is most fundamentally true about the world, um, about the human condition. Um, about a whole host of issues, you know, things like the dignity of human life or the, the definition of marriage or something like that. And so, you know, this is an ongoing debate, uh, especially in the United States right now, the, the conversation is supposedly an online discussion, but it's, it's significant with the whole debate about Christian nationalism. Uh, do we want to legislate, you know, the Apostles' Creed or legislate the Ten Commandments? Um, and again, my Baptist instincts are going to say, well, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Um, and I think you just, you kind of referenced a really important point there, John, when you're talking about theocracy. You know, it was, it was the insights of actually early Baptists and people like Roger Williams in this country who Roger Williams famously said, you know, forced religion thinks in the nostrils of God. And so even like in a, Kind of an order, and I, I don't think it's ever have been able to be tried to say, like in a theocracy, you know, I guess in the modern age, so to speak, Israel is clearly a the ancient Israel is clearly a theocracy. But even if, like, you know, in a, where you have a state church that mandates, you know, forced church attendance, well, what Roger Williams would say is that at the very best, you just get a church full of hypocrites. Uh, you get a church full of people. Who are only there because they don't want to get fined. They're, they're not actually regenerate Christians that are trying to order their lives in a way that pleases God. And so, you know, when you have like a force, you know, church attendance or something like that, you're not actually, um, having societies full of redeemed Christians. Why is that? Well, an inside of Christianity is that it's the spirit, uh, that ultimately converts. You know, none of us can actually convert anyone in our own strength. And so that's why early Baptists understood the importance of religious freedom. Uh, we need to create a con the conditions uh, where people are free to believe what they want to in terms of theology and doctrine and have the freedom to order their lives according to their deeply held convictions. Um, and we let the Spirit do His work. Uh, and so I guess to answer your question directly, Don, I, I think as 
Christians in the public square, you know, we, we, all of the, you know, it was Newhouse in the eighties who wrote that book, you know, the naked public square. And he kind of pushed back on the idea, the secular idea that, oh, you Christians leave your religious belief back at home or in the four walls of your church. And we, we, you know, we make laws and policy based on kind of a, you know, a, a non theological consensus. Well, and what Newhouse viewed in that, John, is that, well, all of us have a worldview. All of us have, you know, commitments and convictions about ultimate things. Whether you're an atheist, or you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew, you're a Jewish person, all of us have ultimate commitments and all of us bring those commitments into the public square. And so where I would draw the line, John, I think as a Christian, I care for, I, my faith teaches me, I don't know, that abortion is wrong. Uh, I think natural law also teaches me that. And so I'm going to robustly argue for that in public policy, but I'm also in the same sense, not going to aggressively try to say that we have a law that uh, requires forced church attendance or something like that, because I, I don't think that it would be helpful at the end of the day uh, or even appropriate. So a lot mm-hmm. there, but I hope I'm getting at your question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't expect us to, um, to come up with the answer here. I mean, the, as you said earlier, this is a very long, <coughs> this is a very long, um, long disputed, long argued debate. I, I think it would be silly for us to say we're going to come up with a simple solution right now. Um, but I do like where you're going with this. And I guess maybe one way that I would look at it is, and, and I'm, I'm going to, I might, I might even like in the next 15 seconds already disagree with myself. So just wrestle with me here. Uh, perhaps laws should reflect scripture in a way that does not impede on the rights of those who are, of the just general rights of those who are not believers. Now, I understand that that in and of itself is a whole can of worms because someone could say, well, that means you would outlaw abortion because, you know, scripture, but that impedes on my right to an abortion. And of course, I would argue that there is no right to abortion. Um, so there, of course, there's there's that whole discussion. But then, you know, to, just to give maybe a more clear example would be, um, you know, as Christians, we we don't swear or, you know, there are, there are things that we don't say um, not necessarily things that are untrue, although that too, but just things that are inappropriate, right? But I would not want to force someone to not be allowed to cuss. You know what I'm saying? Because because that to me is a free speech thing. You know, I don't prefer it, but um, yeah, I don't want to impede on their free speech. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess I'm thinking like, I don't know. I mean, I, I would have to look at each individual, not every individual sin, but like, I would need to look into it more, but I guess that's sort of where I'm floating with it is uh, biblical principles in a way that does not take away from non-believers rights. Um, but then I would be forced to support what is a right. And I'm like, well, okay, well that, that could take forever. Um, so at the end of the day though, there's not going to be an agreement. I mean, even if you, I mean, you and I probably agree on all this, but like, even if we were to say, Establish stuff that is biblically centered that does not, you know, impede on others' rights. Well, they're not going to agree that we're not impeding on their rights, but that's a whole other fun conversation. Um, yeah. So let me, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. And at what point, people who are interested in this conversation, there's a wonderful uh, transcript. Uh, there's a new, pretty new publication called Christ of the Law. Um, and Dave Schrock actually interviews two professors at Southern Seminary, Andrew Walker and uh, Stephen Wellum, who teaches systematic theology. And they have a really helpful conversation about the things that we're talking about right now. I think one thing that Andrew Walker uh, says in that kind of conversation, uh, and again, he's coming at it from a Baptist understanding. Again, he doesn't support establishmentarianism. Uh, but he actually does allow for what he calls a principle of acknowledgement, um, where he's okay with a nation state kind of recognizing the historical reality uh, that Christianity has played um, in that state. Uh, he calls that a historical acknowledgement. Now, that's not the same thing as insisting that you are a Christian nation, and by that we're saying everyone here is a Christian. No, but it is saying that he's fine with things like the public display of the Ten Commandments or the phrase in God we trust on our coin. 
and, and an acknowledgement of, and again, this is an establishing Christianity, but it is kind of acknowledging the historical indebtedness uh, to the Christian faith. And, and I think when you look at the founders, I, you know, they're not all evangelical Christians, uh, but they were certainly informed by a biblical worldview, uh, the tenets of a biblical worldview. Even the way they set up the federal government, you think about the, the division of powers. Well, I think theologically you can say that that's based on an understanding of human depravity. Uh, we, you know, it was Lord Atkins who said, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So even with kind of the division of powers, that's almost a, you know, that's a acknowledgement of something, uh, theologically uh, significant, such as human depravity and human fallenness. And, uh, you know, you don't want to concentrate all the power in one fallen person. You want to diffuse that across three branches. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of this conversation, um, again, I don't use the term Christian nationalist uh, to refer to myself. I, I think that phrase is poison. But I do think uh, Christians uh, shouldn't be afraid. We should also, I think, and maybe this is taking this conversation too far, John. Um, you know, I do believe that that phrase Christian nationalism is being wielded in a really intentional way by, and I'm sure this might be, we might be seeing this in Hungary as well, uh, by those on the cultural left to try to kick or try to dissuade conservative Christians from engaging in politics because no one wants to be called a, you know, but by that boogeyman phrase Christian nationalism. And, and so I don't even, I was like, part of you and I have, you know, you and I have friends who claim that mantle. I don't think it's helpful. I just say I'm a Christian who cares out of love of neighbor uh, for my culture, my society, and I'm going to engage as a Christian uh, kind of in the, the republic that I have to, to live in. No, no, no. You didn't take it too far. I mean, I really appreciate I mean, we've been doing this for years. You know, I try to keep a really loose script so we can really uh, get into the meat and potatoes with all this. And so I'll just reflect real quick on on the Christian nationalism thing. I totally agree that there is abuse on both sides. The left takes it to make it a boogeyman thing and tries to wield it against uh, people. Oh, you don't want to be called this. It's, you know, they'll, they'll equate it with white nationalism and, and things like that, you know, because it has that one word in it. Um, so, the, yeah, the left is definitely capitalizing off of that. However, I also think that there are people who identify as Christian nationalists who are really, really causing a mess. Uh, a lot of them, and, I, and we we both know a lot of these guys, and they can hardly come up with a unified definition of it, you know, in and of themselves. So there's that, but also, you know, I've asked several of them, why do you call it this? Why don't you just call it, you know, conservative Christianity, like we've been doing for years? And and the the, the response I've gotten from several of them has been fairly fallacious, in my opinion. They basically say, well, Christian conservatives have been failing us, and I'm like, well, okay, but. Those are people. I mean, slapping a new title on the same people is not going to do anything. We all have been wanting the same thing. It just seems, I, I don't know, it's gaining a lot of momentum because it's popular, of course, everything on Twitter and whatnot. Um, but I don't really see much of a substance there. I mean, what they're calling for is what a lot of Christian conservatives have been calling for for a long time. Uh, some of them are a bit more extreme, but yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't really see, you know, John, I appreciate some of the aggressiveness and the assertiveness of some of these folks who are advocating for defending the term Christian nationalism. Because again, the left, we have to acknowledge, has become so much more aggressive and so much more um, extreme, honestly. And I, I don't know if you've seen this in the news recently, but, you know, Scotland, uh, just a, a, elected a new first minister. That's kind of what they're, they're praised for the prime minister. And one of the leading candidates was a former finance minister who it was discovered actually believed, you know, Christian convictions. And you had basically she was driven away from, out of that process, uh, because she's a Christian, uh, who actually believes, uh, things that the Bible says about abortion and homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And she, her kind of candidacy was hijacked, basically, uh, when the, her actual theological beliefs were brought to bear. You know, that we're not seeing that that kind of open, public, aggressive, anti-Christian sentiment as much in the United States. Where actually, people are, you know, can't win races because they're, they call themselves Christians. 
But that's on the rise. I think that's a warning what we see in Scotland. That's coming to the United States. It's coming to other European countries. It's already there in some of them. Mm -hmm. And so some of these folks who, again, call themselves Christian nationalists, I think they're right in saying, hey, let's sound the warning sign. The progressives are coming. Uh, They're coming for your children. They're coming for your churches. And to a degree, some of that's right. Um, Yeah, but how does that... that I want to say, you know, I appreciate you know, the the more full-throated articulation of Christian principles. However, um, I think we just need to be careful um, in how we approach it, our tone, and kind of what we're actually advocating for. So I think there needs to be some level of balance. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are a lot of people who have been calling, you know, throwing up the flag for a long time who don't identify as Christian nationalists, but yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Um, I'll give props where it's due. Um, I just, you know, I have a lot of fear about uh, a lot of the Christian nationalists out there and some things they've said, uh, some about race and some about uh, women's places and and uh, in the public sphere, things like that. To just get me a little, uh, uh, it just seems to be a very, very perfect platform to uh, for a slippery slope towards the uh, theocracy and. I don't know. That could be wrong. I don't want to fear monger here, but um, yeah, so moving on. So, yeah. it, Well, and I would just say, so, my, you know, like I told you, my Baptist impulses and instincts absolutely uh, you know, preclude me from going in that direction as far yeah. as theocracy or something like that um, and mm. my belief in religious freedom and things like that. Yeah, uh, no, I get you. It's really important uh, for kind of a robust theologically sound Christian political engagement. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that. Okay, so um, this has been a fun conversation. We, I mean, we could talk for days about this. I do try to keep these somewhat short just because I know people uh, want to listen to it and then uh, go on with the day. Anything else you want to add on the importance of uh, basing, uh, basing law and religion and how to avoid our uh, – actually, you know, I'll just ask this question up front. Uh, what do you do when you have sort of a um, – polyreligious, you know, multi-religions in one society, uh, you know, and you, if we base our laws on one religion, on Christianity, uh, what does that say for the Muslims, the, uh, the non-observant, or sorry, the observant Jews, you know, and who else is in the society? Yeah. Uh, so again, I, I would argue pretty strenuously that we, we don't have a, something like a state church that we don't establish a state church that mandates certain theological beliefs. However, I, you know, you want to be upfront, but I mean, I, I, so John, in a similar way that the atheist comes into the public square with their worldview, Muslim comes into the public square with their worldview, I can't help but come into the public square with a Christian worldview. And I think all law is based on someone's worldview. All law is based on the pre commitment and conviction that you bring to the people. Uh, from something seemingly as cut off from religion as a speed limit. Well, you know, one of the reasons you have a 25 mile an hour speed limit in the neighborhood is because that's community, you know, there's children at play, you want to protect them. Well, that comes from the impulse of that, well, all people are made in God's image um, and then have inherent value, you didn't even want to protect them. As a Christian, that's how I think there's something even as simple as a speed limit. Yeah, and so, I think kind of the, the government itself is only ever going to approximate justice. We're never going to have perfect justice in this world. Not until the new heavens and the new earth when King Jesus is on his throne. And so we want to strive to approximate justice as the best we possibly can. And again, as a Baptist Christian who's thinking deeply about these things or trying <laughs> my best to think deeply about these things, I'm not going to ever pursue laws that would try to bind the conscience in theological and doctrinal matters of my Muslim or Jewish or atheist friend. But my view of their human dignity is it it stems from my Christian convictions, and that will influence the way I enter the public square and try to make public policy. And, and so, again, basic principles I'm against. You know, I'm for the, the separation of church and state. I'm for uh, legislating morality based on kind of very general Christian principles. 
that I believe serve all people, but I'm not going to try to bind someone's conscience uh, in areas that I think only the spirit has sovereignty over. Yeah. I think these important, right, these, these conversations are really important because they sort of serve as an apologetic tool for those who may be wrestling with this. So just haven't really sat down to think about it. So, uh, David, I really appreciate your time. Uh, and I hope this is a profitable conversation for a lot of people who are going to be listening to it. Um, maybe I can include some links in with the, uh, on our Spotify with some resources so we can, uh, send people to read more on this. So, uh, David, really appreciate your time again. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is David Claussen, director of biblical worldview at family research council, a Christian policy tank in Washington, DC. David, thanks again, man. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this MCC podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at corvinec.hu slash en.